Nelson Mandela said, the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. Welcome to the Recreation and Outdoor Education Leadership Speaker Series. I'm Brooke Moran, a professor in Recreation and Outdoor Education. For those of you who don't know, we call that RO. And I'm also the director of this series. Uh, cornerstone of the RO program is providing opportunities for our students to strengthen their leadership skills. So that's through theory, lots of practice, meeting industry leaders, and uh, many other things. But part of the reason for this speaker series is to allow not only Rose students, but other people in the broader Western community and greater Gunnison Valley community, the chance to learn from diverse leaders in different fields with varying backgrounds. So this semester, we'll hear from Malcolm Daly uh, about resiliency and the art of coming back for more. And I won't take too long. You'll get to hear from him really soon. Uh, on October 29th, Gwen Brown, who's a Western alumna, will teach us that despite death threats and uncharted territory associated with her civil rights work in the South, a leader must do. And on November 15th, best-selling author Tyler Hamilton will reveal the insidious and destructive power of lying and the transformational power of truth through the lens of his experiences in pro-cycling doping scandal. Now, a few bits of uh, logistical information. Please kindly silence your cell phones. Uh, there are cards like this uh, that Matthew Ebbett, you give away there, Ebbett, for folks who don't know you. Oh, yes, thank you, Vanna Ebbett. Uh, if you'd like to see uh, who else is speaking for the rest of the semester, grab one of those cards. For those of you at Western, there are posters hanging all around that'll tell the time, date, that sort of thing. As well, if you'd like to be on the email list about speakers upcoming this semester, but also in future semesters, you can also see. <laughs> this is why this guy was hired for this job. Uh, so our plan in this series is to partner with various entities around campus, as well as individuals and entities in the broader community to bring leaders from all walks of life who can provide us insights into the complexities and challenges and benefits of leadership. So thank you very much to the Recreation and Exercise and Sports Science Department and to the School of Business for helping us bring Malcolm in tonight. Imagine what we could do. Imagine pooling our resources and bringing in someone like Malala Yousefzai, the 17-year-old young woman who just won the Nobel Peace Prize to our little Gunnison Valley. We can do a lot with this series. <clears throat> so if you have an idea, if you want a partner, please come see me. My contact information is on one of these cards. So let's get to why we're here. We continue to learn, hear more and more about resilience in relation to sustainability, communities, corporations, people, and so on. It's no longer a term that just relates to ecology. So I wanna offer this definition. It borrows from ecology, business, and human experience. Resilience is the ability to proactively and reactively attack to change. Apply lessons learned from the challenges, mistakes, and or successes to future situations and ultimately to grow and thrive. Malcolm was specifically asked to talk about this due to his challenges, the adversity he's encountered through life, through personal trauma, as well as the myriad businesses he started, grown, and sold in some cases. Little about Malcolm. You've heard of the jack of all trades? This guy kind of, this was the moniker. This is the reason for that. He's an executive education consultant and speaker. He's a chef. He's featured in Great by Choice by Jim Collins that highlights Malcolm's 1999 mountaineering accident to investigate the differences between luck 
and preparedness in overcoming adversity. He performed in the opening ceremonies of the 1972 Olympic Games, and he performed at Carnegie Hall. He climbed the 1,200 foot east face of the first flat iron above Boulder with no hands and no rope. That's like not even the tip of the iceberg of what this man has done and accomplished in his life. He also raised three children and has been married to his lovely wife, Karen, who joins us for 31 years. So through Malcolm's talk, you'll come to understand not just the important role of appropriate reaction to challenges and being resilient, but also the role of preparation and practice and resilience. You'll garner insight into the role that soul, passion, <coughs> and heart have in resilience in business, life, and leadership. You'll also likely contemplate the role of fearlessness and just going for it, while also maintaining humility, compassion, and empathy. So please help me invite Malcolm Daly to the stage, a wonderful friend and inspirational leader. I know I'm supposed to jog across the stage, but I think I'd probably trip. <laughs> I didn't. Um, you guys, thanks for having me. Um, the last, gosh, I don't know, 30 years of my life, 40 years of my life have been just crazy. I uh, graduated, um, oh, let's get a piece of business out of the way. Um, this is R-rated. <laughs> if you're not prepared for this, leave now. <laughs> Nobody's leaving. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the, the last um, 30 or 40 years since I moved to Colorado in 1973, it really kind of prepared me for um, all kinds of things. This is my family photo. My, my dog and my cat, my old dog and cat died um, a while ago. But that was a fun picture we took with uh, Karen and I and my two sons. That was on our Christmas card a few years ago. Um, you know, really, I think my preparation started with um, growing up with my father. He was the, the monumental figure in my life, and he was a man of you know, rock solid. Can I do this? Do you guys mind if I do this? He was a man of, of rock solid integrity. Um, so he was a, a lifelong New England liberal and peacenik, uh, had a, a poster of General MacArthur on his office door that said, um, you know, just a picture of him going ashore at Inchon with a corncob pipe and his quote said, you know, anybody who commits the land force of the United States to the mainland of Asia should have their head examined. And so I grew up around that and he was of such solid integrity that um, he voted, after voting Democratic his whole life when George Bush ran against Al Gore, he voted for George not because he agreed with anything that George Bush stood for, but because he disagreed with Al Gore staying silent on Bill Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky. So sometimes a ramrod, absolutely rigid set of moral, moral ethics can drive you sideways. And I forgive my father for that. But anyway, this would be, and uh, this story is a little bit about how this cute little kid turned into a raving lunatic and how this um, incredibly muscled, well hundred people. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, how, anyway, <laughs> back when I used to climb a lot, I, I was pretty steadily. My, my adopted daughter looked at that picture and she said, dude, you used to be hot. But anyway, now I'm a um, you know, middle-aged, out of shape, post-cardiac, multiple amputee with a brain injury. So this will go through a little bit of that. I spent most of my early years um, in Colorado climbing and backcountry skiing. Um, this really was my life. I mean, I did go to classes. I graduated in four and a half years with a degree in outdoor recreation. You guys know what that means. Most people laugh. Um, 
But anyway, I spent a lot of time tra traveling around the U United States, spring breaks for Yosemite or Red Rocks. Um, summers were spent up in the mountains, climbing high. Um, really worked on my fashion during that time because it's so appropriate to blend in with the crowd. Here's my, can you guys tell which one is me? <laughs> Am I on the left or the right? Well, that's me on the left. And then as we got more mature in our fashion sense, we <laughs> kind of went a little bit the other way. Look at how proud we were, you know? There's no shame there. We, we look like idiots. And the tourists must have been run, you know, to hitting their kids and stuff, and the dogs barked at us. But anyway, I'm gonna burn through a little bit of my career here at Colorado State University. Um, I got part-time jobs to support my education, to buy gas for my car and to go climbing. I was a logger, I was a waiter, I was a chef. I fought forest fires, I was a mountain guide, a ski instructor, and uh, worked as a ski rep and outdoor gear rep. And that led me really naturally into working for one of the big companies in the outdoor industry in the 80s, which was Low Alpine Systems. Design internal frame backpacks, and of course affiliated with the very famous Low Brothers, um, who've, boy, they just climbed about everything on the planet. And that was really influential for me. Um, I was the marketing director for a few years because I could write a paragraph and uh, then moved into PAC product management. Can you guys see through the screen over here? Okay. Um, moved into PAC product management and hardware climbing equipment management. Um, I was there for six years and the company was sold to a cluster of um, British financial organizations. Um, and uh, I began to negotiate to take the climbing equipment component of their business away and start my own business called Trango. And this was the first of my real business lessons. Um, I had a great mentor who was one of my um, clients when I was a mountain guide, uh, and he helped me through the negotiations. And the most important lesson he told me at that time was that I wasn't negotiating unless I could walk out of the room and say no. If I had to have, if I had to make the deal, then I wasn't negotiating. Um, and he kept on reiterating this, and it came to the head when I went to close. I negotiated a deal with them. I had, you know, had a buy-sell agreement, a contract. This is what I was getting. This is what I was paying. This is how much was for the intellectual property. This is how much for inventory. This is how much for the nature of the ongoing business. I went to closing. They, I'd been out of the business for three months. They showed me the uh, sales reports and order reports, open order reports. Um, and I looked at it and I could see the business was in the toilet in the three months I'd left. And uh, so I said, you know, you guys, I can't, I can't pay you what we agreed here because you're not delivering what we'd agreed on. The business is not ongoing anymore. And I said, I'll offer you, you know, half of X or whatever it was. They said no and I got up and I left. We were on the 30th floor of the Skyrise and Denver, I was quaking in my boots. <laughs> um, I had never started a business before, and um, I walked out and I said, see you later. And I went and I called my investor group and I said, you mind if I go to Europe and go shopping? I'd been in the climbing industry by then for almost 20 years, within the, within the world, in the retail business, working with Lowe. I had this fabric of connections all around me, and it was climbers, it was business people in the United States, it was business people and climbers in Europe. I felt like there was a safety net. I think we'd call that a component of resiliency now. I had something to fall back on if what I was trying to do got torn apart. I had, I had a backup. I didn't really have a plan, but I knew something would come together. So um, that happened, and I went to Europe, and I came back as a distributor um, for a number of European brands and then began to develop my own brand called Trango. Um, that was a great lesson for me because I realized that there's strength in the network, in who you know. And we all hear people talk about networking and that's kind of old school, sort of 90s, but yet networking is what it takes to build this dynamic system of support around each one of us and around our businesses. One of our, our 
biggest successes was acquiring the distributorship for a French ice axe and crampon company called Charlie Moser. They were one of the, the premier, if not the premier, company in Europe and worldwide. And um, we took them over the distribution in the United States. When we took it over, they were doing about $25,000 a year in business. And in 18 months, we had them up to half a million and it was still going strong. At the end of um, the third year of doing this, with increasing sales every year, um, I had developed a really, really strong, tight relationship with their European export manager. We were very, very good personal friends. Um, we loved doing business with each other. They were helping me finance the growth. So in other words, they would send me inventory and they would pay it off almost like a revolving line of credit. We'd done it three years in a row. It was working really successfully. We had the best climbers in the world, um, or in the United States anyway, using the tools. Most of the best climbers in the world already were. And um, we built a good, great business. The sales manager, a guy named Felix Bruno, was really into uh, ski mountaineering racing, Randonne racing. And uh, we now, it's all the rage here, right? Schemo, well, they've been doing that for decades over in Europe. And he was training for the Pyramenta, which is the big granddaddy of the races. Um, and the cornice collapsed under him, and he died the day after Christmas in 1997. That was when I discovered the fragility of that great relationship, right? Because it was not a network within me and Charlie Moser, it was with one person. And when he died, the owners of Charlotte Moser, um, they didn't know me. I hadn't made the effort to kind of infiltrate and build my network with them. In July of the following year, right at the low point of my cash flow, right before we were expecting to get in half a million dollars worth of product, they sent me a fax and they said, au revoir. Not even merci, au revoir. And uh, they said, we are sorry, we want, to, we want to do this ourselves. We know better. I'm like, yeah, right. Um, you know, it, it was one of those relationships that I would have told anybody on, in March of that year that it was really strong, it was really good, our future was bright, I had a really tight relationship with those guys. I didn't. Okay, what we had was a strong but brittle relationship, easy to break, it was very monolithic, it was between me and one person over there, Felix Brunod, when he died, the relationship with the company didn't exist. Super important when we're talking about resiliency to network and not have those unitary um, relationships. Okay, it's really good to have a family, a circle, a network, a community, a tribe, whatever you call it. We got lucky. We've done a really good job with Charlotte Moser, which became an import, which had become an important brand for all the shops in the country that sold mountaineering and ice climbing equipment. And they realized that it was Trango, my company, that had done it. So the shops were calling me and said, how can we support you? Can you get us anything else? We don't want Charlotte Moser, we want to deal with you. And I found out that in actuality, I did have a safety net there. And it was my customers in the United States, my climbing friends, that wanted me to stay in business. I brought in a new investor at that point. He was able to float us through that season, and during that time, we built our own climbing equipment, designed our own ice axes and crampons, and that turned into a really good success. And kept us going for another half dozen years. In May of 1999, um, one of my sales reps, a guy named Jim Donini, if you guys are climbers, you're familiar with the name, uh, decided to go do a, a new route in Alaska. And uh, we were headed to Mount Hunter. We, we'd seen pictures of the south buttress of Mount Hunter, and it looked all badass and hard and everything. When we flew in there and actually flew right above it and took a close-up look, it just turned out to be a stupid-looking route. And so instead, we went around the corner. Any of you guys in my talk last night? Raise your hand. Remember what I said, don't set goals? This is a perfect example. We wanted to climb Mount Hunter, one of the big three in Alaska. And, and it, as soon as we actually saw what was in front of us, we, we were able to change our plan. 
Okay, somebody had asked last night in a talk I, was, I had with um, Paul's class um, how I manage all the different things that I do, why I'm not ADD, and I'd like to have them half in jest. I said, I don't set goals. Well, obviously, we had a goal here. We were able to adjust those goals and go out and have a great time. We ended up landing um, at the base of Thunder Mountain, which is right around the corner up the south side of Mount Hunter. And um, when we got out in front of it, we saw there's a beautiful line that goes here. Beautiful, technical, steep, mixed rock and ice climbing, 3,500 feet of climbing to base to summit. And uh, we said, let's do that. Close up detail, it, whoops. As, as, I, as I talk, um, I'll be referring a little bit to uh, the first ice fall here, the second ice fall here, the upper snow field, the heart shaped snow field, and then the final um, little ribbon of ice that was up here. For perspective, this is about 700 feet from here to here. This is a big route. So you get up early in the morning in Alaska in May, it never really gets dark. And uh, so we didn't have headlamps. And I think the camera flashed on this and that's why it looks like that. But um, as we climbed up that lower snow field and got above the first ice fall, getting into some beautiful, beautiful terrain. You know, I think it was, um, was it Galen Rowell wrote that book titled The Hall of the Mountain King? You know, and I think there's a classic opera or symphony called The Hall of the Mountain King. But, you know, if there's anywhere I've ever been that's the Hall of the Mountain Kings, it's in places like this. Just spectacular. You know, when you're out here, one of the things I really love about climbing is that everything matters. Right? How often have you guys been doing something where everything matters? You know, I think if you're a brain surgeon, everything you do matters. If you're an aircraft pilot, maybe everything matters. Um, in climbing, it brings everything into focus because, boy, if we drop a glove, we could be in trouble, right? If we choose to go left instead of going right, we could, have, we could be in trouble. And our actions have very immediate and sometimes dire consequences. And that's what I love about climbing. Uh, it's a wonderful background to get into business because it gives you that feeling of risk, of accepting risk, of evaluating risk, of deciding to go and not go. And uh, it's just been a great preparation for later on um, in all my businesses. As we go up, it gets steeper and narrower and, and uh, get up into the upper ice falls. This is the very top of that 700 foot pillar that we were looking at. And uh, it's looking straight up, so it's really foreshortened. But um, got up above this, and then there was a, a steep section of snow, and then a vert vertical step above that. And at the very top of the vertical step, my ice tools literally were on the summit snow fields. And I yelled down to Jim that I was glad we were getting there because things were starting to melt. It was about 20 degrees, you know, good sun beating on it. So that's actually warm. I mean, you guys know that. It was 20 degrees here and sunny and there's no wind. It's pretty pleasant out. And that's the way it was here. And uh, that's the last thing I remember because something came down and uh, hit me in the head and knocked me off and I fell. I fell about 200 feet hitting my partner on the way down and driving my crampon into his thigh. He got a nice little 12 point pattern in his leg that hit him pretty hard. I shattered my legs on the way down somewhere. It might've been on the final bit, we don't know. Um, but when I came to, uh, I don't remember it, but I put in two ice screws and an anchor and I was clipped in with locking carabiners. So I don't know whether it was just part of that survivor's amnesia or I was on autopilot, who knows? But when I came to, Jim was yelling at me, Malcolm, 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 he thought I was dead. And I'm like, Jim, and he's like, what? It's pissed. <laughs> I said, was I climbing? And he's like, yeah. And I said, did I fall? And he's like, yeah. So anyway, um, open tip fib fracture in the left leg, absolutely destroyed, shattered, crushed, powdered, um, right ankle, um, not in good shape. We, res we self-rescued down to the bottom of that, um, that uh, little ice ribbon we say. So this is looking up at where I spent the next 48 hours, right at the top of that heart-shaped snow field, I'd point out. It's, that would be the right atrium, I think. A atrium? 
what do they call the upper chambers? Who's a doctor? Somebody knows. Whatever. Uh, but you can see the ice ball here in the back, and uh, we got down. This was, by the way, this was on an earlier attempt up there. This was not, I wasn't injured in this because I was not sitting down or standing up. Jim had to chop out a ledge for me. We made the decision at that point that he needed to go um, try to get a rescue going. Uh, one of Jim's, Jim's got some roles, right? He's this old dude. And um, he's got some climbing roles. And one of them is that no oxygen in the Himalayas. For Patagonia, no fixed ropes are allowed. And for Alaska, no radios. So we didn't have a radio. But we had um, arranged with uh, our pilot who flew us to the base to check on us every few days. Now that pilot had flown by early in the morning when I had the two pictures earlier, that picture of Jim sort of standing there on the lay. And uh, we'd give him a thumbs up. Everything was great, you know. The sunny day, beautiful, the ice was perfect. And um, we didn't expect to see him for a few more days. And so Jim was going to go down to the glacier, uh, get himself down there despite his injuries, and try to flag down a plane. And so he um, chopped out the ledge, anchored me into the rock with some rock gear, and then descended down this gully um, that we had just climbed up uh, down to the glacier. And that whole time, I was just focusing on Jim, trying to see him come out at the bottom. It was foggy here, obviously, but trying to find a way to do that, um, to focus on him. I did see him actually exit right down in here, and then he went out of sight. Our base camp was right over here, just a little bit out of sight. And uh, I gave him a whoop whoop, and he gave me a whoop whoop, and he had to crawl over to the base camp because that, I, he had a world-class Charlie horse and 12 puncture wounds. So he wasn't walking too well. So I'm sitting there. I don't know what's going on. I'd thrown the rope down. Jim had the ropes. I had the big down jacket. I had the, the bagels and the cliff bars. And uh, I had a wide mouth water bottle. Um, I was sitting on a ledge. My feet were in the pack. And um, Jim had disappeared. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, so I'm there trying to settle in a little bit. And uh, all of a sudden I heard a plane set up, got the mixture, and start to land. I'm like, holy crap, what, what's going on there? You know, it was another party coming in, but a plane's there. Turns out our pilot, this is part of the network, Jim had arranged for our pilot to fly by every few days. Like I said, he'd already flown by that morning. He had a creepy feeling, and he knew something was going on. And he was flying back at the end of the day. It was about 6 o'clock, and he just said, you know what, I'm going to go check on those guys once again. And he flew over the ridge about 10 minutes after Jim got down to base camp. And uh, Jim came out and he waved his big orange suit. and He landed and got Jim flying out. And they were able to get a rescue going. So that night, rescue didn't happen immediately. That night it clouded up and it started to snow and I'm at the base of that 700 foot cliff in a corner system right next to a gully, about as bad a position as you can be for avalanches, and it started snowing. And it was light snow and it was nice because on those, on those um, steep cliffs it doesn't pile up, it doesn't build slabs, but you get bombed by uh, spindrift avalanches. You know, So I spent the night sort of dealing with this kind of stuff, this isn't me, but um, you guys have ever ice climbed or, you know, been below the lee of a ridge or had the wind blow, you know, the snow bombs out of a tree and get inside your coat, you know how that is. So all night, you know, over and over and over ago, and I'm just dealing with this. Every time one would come down, it would pack snow between me and the edge of the ledge, and I'd have to, you know, it would try to push me off the ledge. And even though I was tied in, I didn't want to be hanging there. Um, so I'd have to dig that out and then clear it out of my jacket and do it all over again, do it and do it, you know, again and again and again. Um, the next morning, um, I woke up. I didn't actually fall asleep, but when it got light, um, I was warm. I'm like, holy cow, I'm warm. I'd taken care of my feet as best I could. I'd put them inside the pack. I'd pack some snow over it so if a rock came down or something, it wouldn't bang them. I'd cut the laces on my boots to allow as much circulation as I can. But I knew my feet were freezing. I knew they were freezing. 
but you know within an hour of daylight and it clearing up um, I, they started flying rescuers in and they brought in helicopters and fixed wing planes and they brought in rescue members from three groups the Denali National Park Rescue Team the volunteer rescue group from Anchorage and Talkeetna and also the military the 212th Airborne Air National Guard out of um, Elmendorf they're the paratroopers guys jump out of helicopters into the ocean and stuff and so that whole day was pretty interesting. It's, it got sunny, it was kind of nice. They were flying helicopters around and bringing people in and there were, I could see rescuers down on the glacier below me and we were whoop whooping and the helicopter was flying up and down right in front of me for a couple of hours. I'm like, what the hell is he doing? You know, when's he gonna stop and like shoot me a thermos of soup out of an air cannon or something? <laughs> I didn't, they don't, they don't do that, right? <laughs> but um, I kept on, I, I wasn't sure what was going on. And, just kind of to, again, put it in perspective, I'm, I'm right there at the top of that upper left-hand lobe, okay? So they're flying helicopters up and down this chasm. You saw how tight it is, right? And they finally, the helicopter disappears for about half an hour. I'm like, oh man, they forgot about me. And finally, it comes up again, and this time he goes up here, and he's flying around up here, and it's like, you know, dude, what are you doing up there? It turns out that the helicopter pilot had decided that they couldn't get me off via a short haul, which basically means hanging a long rope under the helicopter, putting a rescuer on that rep, that helicopter, and then having them, you know, fly in together. They decided they couldn't do it. And so he was looking for a place up here to land rescue team members who would then lower a rope down to me and then haul me up, right? I would have been dead for sure. But what almost killed me instead was a slab avalanche, the rotor concussion knocked off. So this thing came bombing down the gully and just buried me for like five minutes. And they were, uh, all the rescuers scrambled, right? I could, before it hit me, I saw them going, oh my God, get out of the way. They were 2,500 feet below me, but it was super still and quiet and I could see them run. And, and uh, this big slab came down and um, covered me, but you know what? It was steep enough that it all went right over my head. I was just getting sort of the light, fluffy stuff pounded me on my back. It, was, it was, wasn't quite as nice as a massage, but that's effectively, that's kind of what it was. When that all cleared, um, you know, I'm like, woo-hoo, you guys didn't get me, suckers. And um, anyway, it was late in the day. They had to go down and make dinner and stuff like that, so it got dark. And um, the second night was, um, a different deal. It was a clear night, it was super cold. Second night in a row went down below zero, according to the guys on the glacier. Um, I was lonely, I was worried. What do I do? Um, I decided, I, 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 you know, this is kind of, I don't know, what do you do when you're stuck on the side of the mountain and you know there's rescuers there, you're not sure they can get you. I have very, very clear memories of making the decision to live. I said, you know what, I'm going to live. I'm not going to take this passively. I'm in this crappy situation. Um, but there's some things I can do. I said, I can try to stay awake. I can try to stay warm. And so every time I started to get cold or started to fall asleep, I'd do 100 windmills with one arm, then 100 windmills with the other arm, and then 100 sit-ups on the ledge like that. And pretty soon, I could only do 50 with one arm and 50 with the other. And so it became a counting game. Then it was 30 with one arm, and then it was 20 with each arm. I'd go back and forth and I'm like, was that 60 or was that 80 I did that time? But that became kind of my touch point. And it became a process of, um, you know, setting that goal, I'm gonna live. So I do set goals once in a while. <laughs> making a plan and then executing on that plan. So between windmills, you know, that's when you think. So think about my beautiful wife, think about my kids, you know, they're all out there and uh, wondering what they were gonna do. Kit was, um, what, seven years old, Mason was 10, something like that, and thinking, man, you know, they need a daddy, I wanna be around. Importantly, I thought about other people who lost their feet. By that time, I'd realized that I was not I was going to lose my feet. I was absolutely convinced. I gave up on them. I did everything I could to protect them, but I wasn't going to sit there and perseverate on frozen feet. I don't believe in woulda, shoulda, coulda. 
okay we don't look back to worry about things and second guess we look back to learn and go forward and so i look back at friends that i had that were amputees here's you hair multiple amputee climbing a route in uh, the gunks that's never been repeated and how can a multiple and double amputee climb something that's been repeated well he made his legs extra long. He's just seven and a half feet tall when he wears those <laughs> legs, <laughs> right? They say he was cheating. Hugh is now the leading developer of prosthetic, lower limb prosthetic devices and runs that portion of the media lab at MIT. And he's developing, you know, all these um, mechanized and um, microprocessed powered ankles and feet for amputees. And so he's taken his um, shit sandwich, if you excuse the expression, <laughs> and um, you know, fed himself a pretty good meal. My friend Mike Crenshaw lost a leg in a farm tractor, a PTO uh, pulley, uh, when he was 19 years old, and he's one of the most badass skiers and mountain bikers. He's rigged his mountain bike, so he pedals with one real foot, sits on the saddle, pedals with one foot. Think about that. I couldn't keep up with him with two feet back then. Warren McDonald, you know, um, just an incredible um, inspiration. Both legs gone about six inches below his crotch, and he gets out there and ice climbs. And then I do another set of 100 windmills on one side, 100 on the other, 100 sit ups on the ledge. And then I'd start thinking, okay, what happens if I lose all my limbs, you know? Maybe I can be the guy with a big brain and rule the world, you know? <laughs> just like be Dr. Evil, but do good things. And, and, uh, or maybe I could just be the guy behind the curtain, you know, and go back and run my company and be the secret leader, you know, and let other people go, because I'd be too gross for people to watch. But what actually happened was it got light, and um, all of a sudden the helicopter started flying around again. And, uh, you know, I kind of came out of that darkness, and, uh, That's supposed to be cool. <laughs> Sorry. And um, you know what happened again? Remember where I was way up here? And uh, here's, here's what happened. Watch this video. That's me right up in that little spot. This is back in the day before they had, you know, stabilization and stuff, and digital zoom, or uh, optical zoom. Helicopters got the line laid out in front of them. A guy named Billy Schott, who's the barrel man, he's gonna be on the bottom of the rope. Helicopter goes up, they don't have winches in the mountain helicopters because they're too heavy. And if you look at the helicopter, it's got an open tail boom and a giant motor and, uh, you know, just little webbing things for a seat. So it goes, so uh, that's Billy there. That's a helicopter up there. That's me there. And that's Billy climbing up to me. So so hard to see, I'm sorry. We have shaky cam, but. When he got to me, I realized he was climbing on a pair of the ice tools that I designed and manufactured. My first words to him were, man, cool tools. <laughs> my exercise plan worked when I got down and they put me in the first aid tent and they took my temperature. My core temperature was 96 and a half degrees. I wasn't even shivering.
So watch here, you'll see us go up. Kind of an alcove, we swung around out of sight. And was, I'm yelling at Billy, don't let us hit the wall, don't let us hit the wall. And you'll see us kind of go up over here. I didn't know who it was on the rope, and uh, uh, he had the helicopter bubble on, and you know, I'm all like adrenalized because I just got rescued, and I'm alive, and we're flying down, and um, I said, hey, I'm Malcolm Daly, glad to meet you, and he goes, you don't know who this is? I'm like, no, and he ended the little screw in his bubble visor, and he flipped it up, and he goes, it's Billy Shot. It was like, the guy I used to climb with in Fort Collins. Again, those networks are important, you know, those, the relationships you build, the bridges you don't burn, um, we'll come back and uh, help you out down the road. That's my pack. Billy's kind of holding me cradled, but I'm also hanging from the rope. These rescuers are running up to grab my legs so they don't get pile driven into the snow. The guy running the rescue is another good friend from Fort Collins who ran the outdoor program there for years named Daryl Miller. He was the rescue ranger on Denali, and he comes over here and says hi to me, and I go, Daryl! That's him in the black. So I was in pretty good shape besides having totally frozen feet. I get into the hospital, they thaw me out, they put an intermedullary rod in my right leg. That's the bandage you see there on my shin, but you can see my right foot, it's not looking too good. Um, over the next uh, two years almost, went through a series of 17 operations to try to heal my left leg and also fuse my right ankle. Nothing worked, so in uh, July of um, 2001, finally I was like, okay, guys, I'm tired of being crippled. I could get around, I was ambulatory with crutches or a wheelchair, but I was in pain all the time. I said, I'm tired of being a cripple, I want to be an amputee. And so, um, they uh, amputated my right leg, used parts of the bone to rebuild the uh, non-union fracture in my left leg, and I'm happy as a clam because I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, we have a date. This is when I'm going to be able to walk again. This is when we're getting this, you know, thing off my leg. And um, you can see my left foot is pretty damaged from the frostbite. It's all kind of withered and shrunk it up. It's still, my left foot is my bad foot, by the way. It's my real foot. Um, it's the one that hurts all the time. My prosthetic foot, as I get older and my body gets more decrepit every year, the only thing that gets better is my prosthetic. It's time to get a, get a new one. It's better technology. And so I kind of look at that as, you know, the dividing. That's when I entered version 2.0 of me, right? And uh, I could, you know what I got to do is I got to reinvent myself, right? So all of a sudden, here I am. I'm, I'm now a uh, amputee. And uh, what do you do, you know? As an amputee, you go for it. Why, why not? We don't, we don't have to be the village cripple. We don't have to sit there and be unproductive. We don't have to stop thinking. We don't have to stop dreaming. Okay, part of that, a big part of that is because of the support I had. I went back to work at Trango um, just a month after my accident, a month, after my, month and a half after my accident, 
and I'm back in that circle of friends, I'm back with my family, and um, that network, that fabric really is the fabric of a trampoline that helps you spring back. I'm a gear designer, right? So doing a climbing foot for prosthetics, no big deal. So you guys climbers here, anyone climbers? All right, so um, I, 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 thin cracks are the real problem with a prosthetic foot because you can't twist it. So I designed one that was like wedge shaped, you see that? And went over and tried Fat Cat in Indian Creek. And, um, failed miserably, right? Um, those of you guys who've been on that route know that this is the ground right over here. And that's as far as I got, it didn't work. But you know, what the hell, I kept going and I designed a, um, climbing foot that actually is in production now and uh, other amputees can buy and climb and uh, there is actually, there's two or three people are using it and they're climbing 513, climbing the nose in a day. I know if you're not a climber, that's all gobbly good, but it's good. It's a good thing. Um, ice climbing was even more fun, actually. You know, as ice climbers, we, we use adaptive equipment anyway. We can't just go climb ice because our feet don't stick and our hands freeze and stuff. So I actually got to eliminate a piece of adaptive equipment because the heavy plastic boots we wear are just there to protect your feet from cold and, and abuse and also to attach crampons to. So if you don't have a foot, you don't need a boot, and you can go right from the prosthetic like a crampon. And um, it's kind of like cheating. I also got to further extend my network because as an amputee, as somebody with a disability, I've become a member of a club. And whether I liked it or not, I'm in this group. And so when Aaron Ralston got trapped in Little Blue John Canyon, I found out how to get a hold of him through his boss, who's again part of my network, he on the Ute Mountaineer. He said, here's Aaron's cell phone number, give him a call. He was in the hospital and uh, uh, you know, he picked up the phone. I said, Aaron, you don't know me. My name's Malcolm. Let's go climbing. And he's like, dude, I don't have a hand. I'm like, yeah, so I don't have a foot. And so we got together in El Dorado and um, when we actually climbed the longest, hardest rock climbing route Aaron had ever done in his life. I just assumed he was a rock climber. He wasn't much one. We ended up on top of the 700 foot tower too in El Dorado. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to make that day even better, we, you know, you, you saw that picture of the last frame of his, you know, he's basically got his little Captain Hook thing. Um, we went down to a, a machine shop and we designed a new climbing prosthetic, um, designed, you know, out of Trango ice axe parts and stuff. And this is the closest I ever get to start on this that was on the cover of his book. <laughs> so this led to me thinking about how to reach out. I'd already started one nonprofit, a couple of nonprofits in the climbing world. One was the Access Fund and another is a, uh, the local kind of chapter, local climbing organization. And I got to start Paradox Sports. So I knew a little bit about nonprofit management, nonprofit financing donors and things like that. And I got together with Timmy O'Neill and Captain DJ Skelton. Timmy's just a regular crazy guy, but he'd taken his paraplegic brother up El Cap a couple of times by that time. DJ's a wounded warrior, um, got blown up in Iraq, and a climber, very, very um, cool, solid guy. And we put together this organization to try to help people get on that path to the life of excellence using the vehicle of human-powered outdoor sports. It had meant so much to me, it had given so much back to me as um, I uh, had gone through life and my various epics that I wanted to be able to share that with other people. Um, just some shots, Chad Jukes, another guy who was blown up in Iraq, lost his foot. Um, he was my first client, is the Limb Reaper, they call me, because I counsel people and amputations, and so I've earned this nickname. And uh, so far they've all been successful, but uh, Chad's been a great one. He has since moved to URA, lives there year-round, and ice climbs like a madman. And then just some of the other things we do, Warren McDonald up here, you saw him before, but uh, we've done various surfing programs, stand-up paddle boards, uh, wilderness fly fishing trips, um, ice climbing trip every year. Um, been a really good educational experience for me uh, to do it, and it's really summed up by 
the story of Krista, who was trapped in a crushed building uh, during the landslide in Haiti. Um, she was a climber uh, from Phoenix, and uh, she get, got trapped under the stairway that collapsed and was evacuated pretty quickly to Tampa, but still ended up losing her feet. And all her friends started reaching out to me because I knew Malcolm, the one-legged climber, you know, go oh, call Krista. Um, they gave me her phone number, and she picked up the phone in Tampa, and she goes, hi, this is Krista. It was a day after she'd lost her foot, and she's perky and cheerful, and you know, look at that picture, she's pretty chill, right? And um, as we were talking, um, I had invited her to come to our ice climbing program in Uray in March, which was um, 61 days after the earth shook in Haiti, and she showed up. She'd never ice climbed before. She said, what the hell, let's go for it. She put on an ice boot, and uh, Actually climbed a couple of pitches. She'd had her, her walking prosthetic for one day before she came to Uray. Um, she couldn't walk without crutches at the time because she hadn't trained. And um, this is what she had to say about it. You guys get that? So anyway, what we were trying to do with, with Paradox Sports was, was take this paradigm and turn it into this paradigm, right? No reason. You guys are down here. You've got one of the best adaptive programs in the world up at Crested Butte. And uh, we spent a lot of time having great um, success um, helping people through our paradigm of outdoor sports to get their um, metaphoric feet under them. Um, Para I left Paradox Sports a few years ago. Um, it's now on its fourth executive director, so it's had high turnover. It's a really stressful, low-paying job. Um, but it's got legs. Again, no pun intended, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm really proud that I was able to take the experiences I learned from the outdoor world, from my own traumatic uh, experiences. By the way, I had a heart attack in that then, too. I just didn't show any pictures. Um, and uh, watching it survive leadership transitions, which are so often de devastating, each one of those, you need some resiliency when you go from one leadership style to the next. Watch it survive and thrive and grow has been one of the cooler things that I've been able to experience. Um, you know, now I'm sitting in Boulder, I'm trying to be retired, and uh, I'm lucky because my family and best friends are in town. And uh, I'm learning that I suck at retirement. I thought I'd just be able to sit around and have clothes with my wife. And uh, that didn't work. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> um, I, I pick up some work as a, as a leadership trainer and a business consultant. Um, I work as a chef occasionally. and. Uh, I just got uh, hired on as a cooking coach, which I'm really psyched for. And um, I work three days a week at Neptune Mountaineering, the climbing shop in, um, in Boulder. And uh, what I'm trying really hard not to do right now is being drug into starting a yakitori joint with a friend of mine who's dying to get one going because there's none of them around. So anyway, I look at this sort of thing really as the beginning, not the end. I don't know what's gonna happen next. Um, maybe I'll win the lottery and I can sit around naked with my wife, but probably not. <laughs> um, we don't know what we're going to do. But anyway, you guys, that's uh, my story. I'm sticking to it. And um, thanks so much for coming. I'm around for questions. I'm going to sit at the edge of the stage because I'm tired of standing. My leg's killing me. So thanks for coming. <laughs>